thank you so much for being here on what I know is a beautiful evening and there are tons of activities going on in our community. I want to let you know that the Oriel Advocates are here to lend a voice to the students, teachers, and staff of the Avon Community School Corporation. We are truly a grassroots organization that does advocacy at every turn, from working with our town council members, to our school district leaders, to our teachers, to our state representatives. So thank you for being part of our event this evening. One of the things that I want to start with is a big thank you to the teachers and the educators in the crowd. So what I'd like you to do, if you work in the field of education, is raise your hand high and proud. And let's give a round of applause. And I'd like for you to follow that up this evening with a tweet to a Facebook post to an Instagram to and about one of your favorite teachers. Let's rally our entire community to thank those people who serve our community and serve our, our children. Because without them, we would not have a productive society. Thank you again, teachers. I'd also like to thank Maggie Parnaman and Scott Windham, who have just been our bedrock in, term, in terms of keeping the advocates going. So I don't know where you are, Maggie and Scott, kind of lost you in the crowd, but thank you so much. You are the essence of great leadership, and we, we would not be an advocacy group without you. Those public officials who come out and tirelessly work for our schools, I'd like for you to also raise your hand so that we can see you here. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Steve Eisenhardt's in the frame. Don Hudson's here. I may have missed someone, and I apologize. I hope that I acknowledge all of you. Just a little bit on the logistics for this evening. Um, Dr. McCormick has a presentation prepared for you and a slideshow backdrop. You can follow her on Twitter. There's her Twitter um, feed and at Educate Indiana. Um, and you can do that this evening um, as you leave or take pictures or whatsoever. Make sure to push those out. She has a wonderful presentation prepared for us. And then she has generously offered to take audience questions. So at the conclusion of her presentation, two of our advocates will be kind of staffing the microphones here. And we ask you to come up and give your name and, and pose your question. We will be concluding by 8 p.m. The advocates always try to start on time and finish on time. My students, some of my students are here. Thank you for being here. And they're teachers, so <laughs> shouts out to them. Um, but they know that I like to start on time and end on time. Maggie Horman likes that too. Let's get to the topic of the evening. Dr. Jennifer McCormick is our 44th superintendent of public instruction. She's a na nationally recognized educator and innovator. innovator. She has served at every level of the K-12 education system. She has been a secondary special education and language arts teacher, an elementary principal, an assistant superintendent, and served as superintendent for seven and a half years. As Indiana's education system leader, Dr. McCormick is an energetic and tireless advocate for children dedicated to improving educational outcomes. She's a sought after speaker, so we feel very privileged that she is willing to spend an evening with us here this evening and serves as a devoted ambassador for ensuring all stakeholders are working together for student success in Indiana. She has served on a number of community boards and makes her home in Indianapolis work with her husband, Trent, who's also a teacher. They have one son, Cale, who attends West Point Military Academy. So let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Jennifer McCormick. Well, good evening. I swear I'm gonna take that introduction and it's only gonna say at this point, Rebel Rouser, because that's pretty much what it is at the State House right now. So we can really shorten that down, but I do appreciate being here this evening. It is extremely important you ask questions. We are going to give you some information, but a big part of this is making sure you are informed. So a lot of it is just providing you with the data that is necessary to make some decisions and make sure you are communicating. To the Avon Advocate Group, I cannot thank you enough. It is so impressive to have a parent group that gets out with, you, with your students and your staff 
gets out ahead of things and really tries to educate a community. So thank you for the invite tonight and everything you're doing for the students here in your community. For all of you who are extremely busy educators, which means everybody right now in the spring, thank you for being here. I know how incredibly busy the spring is, so I'm cognizant of your time, so thank you for that. To the retirees, sit back, life's good. We'll, we'll get you through. So, but I do appreciate being here. Some of this for our superintendents, I'm gonna say uh, right off the bat, I apologize, you have seen this uh, several times, parts of it. But we're going to start out by just presenting some information around who we are. Why do I present this? And why do I tell people we need to continue to present this? If we take our eyes off who we are, we take our eyes off good policy, good efficiency of our resources, and the list goes on. But this is an update right now of who Indiana is. You get outside of Marion County, Hendricks County, Hancock County, I can name you the, the donuts, Hamilton, you get outside of that area, people are sometimes amazed by these numbers, especially the ones that talk about the language is spoken. We have 291 across the state of Indiana. With that comes expense. With that comes opportunity. And I would argue, and I've had this conversation with our lawmakers, that is an area that we are not celebrating enough and we're not funding enough. And there's an interesting balance of that. The other one up here that always gets people's attention that I know some of your districts, some of you are in here, would say, I would love to have a free and reduced rate of 48%. That is not who we are. We are in the 70s, we're in the 80s. So I understand that free and reduced number for some, that's a state average, that number continues to creep up. And this is no surprise to the educators in here. Why is that happening at a time where there's extreme unemployment? It's because of the working poor. We know we have families that are making $10 an hour, they're working multiple jobs. We now have the highest number of students living with grandparents who are being raised, the highest number of foster children, and the highest number of homeless students. Let that sit in, because that's a conversation that we're not having. So right now, as far as K-12, if you ask our educators, many of them will tell you that's not a surprise. That is not a surprise. Others, depending on where you are in the state, are somewhat shocked by those numbers. The demographics across the state obviously look very different from school to school, but yet Indiana's really good about making policies of one size fits all. So keeping our eye on this is extremely important to do. The other area is the English language learners. Those are our students who speak English as a somewhat second language. I will tell you that is a budget area that everybody's watching. We're still getting noise in that area. We were promised, or not we didn't promise, but it was promised through legislation that you would hit a specific at a target, that you would get a big bump in your per student pay. That hasn't really come to where it needs to be. We were looking at potentially $1,000 per student. We are running about $282 per student. So what we did in our budget ask is said, you have to double that to even come close. You have to double it. So we went from 17 million to NRS to 34 million, which would still not get us to where we need to be, but we doubled that amount. Unfortunately, as you can see, the governor came out and went 15 million, so we're kind of sliding back a bit, which we were a little bit disappointed to see. The House came out with a little bit more, and then the Senate came out with a tad bit more. So at least we're going in the right direction, but we're still having conversation because many of you who call are wanting resources, you need licensed people, you need the finances to follow it. So that EL number we are watching closely, that is something that we're just nowhere near where we need to be with funding. I will give a shout out to Senator Mishler, who is obviously in charge of appropriations. He is one that is watching this and trying to get some movement. We've had a lot of discussion. He asked for a lot of numbers, which you have to appreciate. They all know it's underfunded. They are very, some of them are very concerned, but you have to, you can't have a few. It takes more than that to get that budget going, but that is just something that we are watching because that is an area that I foresee over this biennium to still, we will still be struggling, but those numbers continue to creep up. This is us. So 35% of our teachers are leaving between years one and five. Now, I don't know about you, but if you've ever had a business, you've ever been in a school system, there are a lot of superintendents and CFOs here tonight, you know how difficult it is if you're losing 35% of your teaching staff in years one through five. Now, there are some districts that are like, that's not us. 
There are other districts that will tell you well, that's way over where we are or way under, depending on where you are. When we survey pays the number one reason, the second reason is working conditions. So we are having that conversation. Today was a big rally in the State House that I'm not a big rallyer, to be honest with you, but you better believe I participated today because of some of the things that are happening in the state level. But interesting to watch some of those numbers and some of the conversations that are happening. And we're going to talk about the budget. But we have 78,000 teachers. Thankfully, we had the biggest increase since 2010 in teachers being licensed. The issue is we also have the biggest number of temporary licenses still being issued. So is there a problem? Yes. When I talk to people, they still will say, well, that's your STEM area. That's your science, technology, engineering, and math. Yes, it is. It's also special education. It's also EL. It's also our school's counselors. It's also finding good administrators. I mean, the list goes on. Now, I sat as a superintendent for seven and a half years between Anderson University and Ball State University. And back in the day, I would have stacks of applicants, stacks. So it was like game on. You knew you were gonna get good people. By the time I left, before I lost my mind, but by the time I left, that stack got really, 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 really thin, really thin. And I was sitting between two universities. There are districts that still have stacks, but there are many more that are paper thin stacks. So if we're not going to react to that, we are going, we're already in trouble, but that urgency has passed us. We're already beyond that. It is almost in crisis mode. We have got to have good educators if we're going to see results. It's not a secret. As many of you have had your own kids in classrooms, or you're in the classroom still, or you have grandkids that are sitting in classrooms, you know the power of great educators. If we can't figure this out, we're in big, big trouble. But this is also who we are to help share that information. The turf option I put up here is something that many of you are familiar with. It's being discussed in order to help save districts some money on the end of your payment to turf percentage, which gets a little bit weedy. But it is a, I found it to be a good solution for from the governor's office. We were pleased to see that. They met with this. Our team could get behind that. It's hard to turn down that money. Fast forward to a 13 check decision came out for some of our retirees and so if you're a retiree don't shoot the messenger um, but there are a lot of moving parts with the turf right now so trying to find solutions but also some other things that are coming out that are a bit problematic with turf budget facts you know people if you're watching twitter right now it's interesting to say people will say hey you're stirring it up and i'm like i'm just sharing facts and if the facts there stir it up there's something wrong with the policies creating facts so here they are we have, obviously, inflation, the general fund, K-12 tuition, and economic development fund. Those aren't my numbers. Those are Indiana's numbers. Those are just factual numbers. That's what you need to keep watching. Your districts are well aware of those numbers, but those are just the facts. We also look at the governor or the um, K-12 budget quick facts. When we rolled out our budget in October, when, I, when it was the day we rolled out our budget, I was like, look, I'm out. A lot happened that day. But when we rolled it out, I said, you know what? I am a little bit worried. I'm going to come in low. Like our budget asked, I knew I could get crazy, but I was worried we would come in low, which would be a great thing to happen. But I also knew, too, that we were wanting to support all our educators. Interestingly, we're still the highest because given a time where we're hearing a lot of messaging about we want to get more money into the classroom, we're still seeing numbers that aren't going to equate to money into the classroom for probably about 25 to 30% of our district. So watching those numbers is extremely important right now. Again, this is where we are landing. They are dissecting those numbers. The Senate number came out a little bit better per se, but when you look at the holistic piece, the House budget would benefit more districts. So there are a lot of moving parts. Don't get hung up on just the percentage increase because there's so many, there are so many other pieces of the complexity to it that it doesn't tell the whole story. So some of our districts are like, well, we're getting like, you know, a little bit of a raise. Yeah, but have you looked at the circuit waiver waiver? Have you looked at what's happening with some of these other pieces? So you have to look at the whole picture, which is what we're trying to keep an eye on. But that's where we are right now with the budget quick facts. This is us as a state. So this is not a surprise to many of you. However, I think it's always a good reminder. 
So although we serve 1.2 million students, and that number's pretty much flatlining, a little bit up, a little bit down, but pretty much flatlining since 2012, you can see what's happening to schools. So where we have traditional districts going down just a bit, um, traditional schools going down just a bit, we have the non-pubs, the voucher program is soaring, which we get a lot more applications for non-public schools now, and I will be honest, I'm a big person about quality matters. So if we're gonna have school choice, we need to have it that it's a quality, not behind a taco stand and open for the best. It needs to be quality matters. So that number we're watching, and the charter school number is super fluid right now. I honestly, it is hard for our team to keep up with. As fast as some open, there are just as many shutting down. But we have an increase of about 52%. So regardless of your philosophy on choice, the whole picture here talks about the philosophy of, and it should talk to, the quality choice. Our students are very, very transient, very transient. So if one pocket of schools isn't getting it done, we're all gonna feel it one, one way or another. So this is us as far as schools. Again, numbers to watch. I mean, it really does tell a story. We're also working with some universities to talk about capacity, because I don't think as a state we're talking about capacity enough. When does that time come when we have hit a threshold where enough is enough? How much choice do we need? Like the taco stand schools, how many of those do we need? And that's legit. So when does that come where enough is enough and we've hit that capacity threshold? People will talk about the teacher shortage, but I also remind them the more schools we are servicing, the more chemistry teachers we need, the more physics teachers we need, because it doesn't work so much that just because of a Yorktown may lose 50 kids, I'm not cutting a calc teacher, a physics teacher, I still need all of those. And so it doesn't quite work the way people are making it sound to work. Well, if you don't need those teachers anymore and that school needs them, aren't we just kind of switching from one location to another? No, no. It just doesn't necessarily work that way. So the capacity conversation here, again, what is our threshold? When does that need to come into play? Because we're already short teachers and we're just making the conversation worse. Interesting as well, when we talk about access and opportunity for students, this plays into that. So if you can't find a physics teacher, that plays into this. If you can't find a Spanish teacher or a Russian teacher or a Cal teacher, this plays into that. So all these conversations about capacity need to take place, but I tell you, it is not popular. It is not a popular conversation, but we're watching that as a department. We're also watching this. So that graduation rate, I know there are some schools that are represented tonight that your grad rate is high, 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 which is a good, good thing. That doesn't happen by accident. But I can tell you the demographics of many of our districts are very, very different. So I walked into some schools that are not great on the grade and they don't have a great graduation rate and I would send my son there in a New York minute because of what's happening in that school. I've also walked into some schools and I'm like, you have been an A for 15 years and I would not attend there. The opportunity is different. So it just depends on what is happening in that school without getting hung up too much on letter grades. But the graduation rate does tell the story. Interesting, this year in legislation, we had a 1404 that was introduced, and we came out and said, ah. Now, there were some people that loved it. I, just as a state superintendent, as been a local superintendent, the thought of not including graduation rate in anything accountability for high school did not set well with me. So people were like, well, it's in there, it's grad pathways. It wasn't if you looked at the language. It was not in there. Now, since then, they put it in, they put it in, However, it was absent to begin with, and many of our schools do a fairly good job with the grad rate. Now, I do believe, I was told earlier that it didn't get pulled up, so we'll see what happens to 1404, but the accountability piece with the grad rate is just interesting to watch. Something we're paying attention to are the gaps. So we have two accountability systems in Indiana, one's state, one's federal. The federal, the department's in control of. On the federal side, we are watching the subgroups, how we break that down. Because when you lump everybody together, it doesn't look so bad. When you start looking at individual subgroups, we should be a little bit concerned, especially if you look over at the AP column. We should, that should give us some pause. When you throw everything together, it becomes a very different story. Now the state, whether we like it or not, we can have that debate, but the state throws it all together. We will keep it separate, 
On the federal side, which I know, I was a principal during a time where we did this, and it is hard. It's hard to move subgroups. You know who those subgroups are gonna be that are gonna be, you're gonna be hung up on. Our biggest charge is, I wish there was a way to do it without it being so punitive, but until that time comes from the federal end and from the state end, that's where we are. But this helps us drive our resources. So we have been committed to say, what are the areas, who are the target subgroups that we need to beef up our resources? Special education is one, ELL is another. Some of our subgroups by ethnicity would be others. So we have really been better to target our support. Interestingly, the department is targeting supports. And when we do that, it's very, very purposeful. So it really would make no sense, and I'm gonna use Yorktown as an example because I can beat up my old back, back school and it's not really a beat up, it's a reality. I wouldn't have needed as much support as a Gary, Indiana. So our charge is get resources to Gary, give Yorktown a little bit of what they need, but get resources to where they need to go. Our plan was made up that way. So schools that were comprehensive and need a support, like in big, big, big trouble, we had a mechanism to give them a comprehensive support plan. The state doesn't necessarily like that. So some of our lawmakers, the powers of be, said, uh-uh. So where I had a bunch of F and D schools that I was trying to get money to, I was pretty much forced to give them to some C schools. That is hard, hard, hard to defend. So when those F schools call and say, what in the world? Why are we not getting any money? Because they know darn good well that the C school just got a bunch of money. It is a hard, it's hard to explain that. So we are watching these numbers for a lot of reasons, but you just have to know conflict in the state, which is not good, but it's there, it's real. It's, but as a state superintendent, we will continue to try to get our resources to our most at risk. It's no different than what you do at the local level. That's usually how you roll. Graduation rates. If we can pay attention to the third one down, traditional public school rate, for the first time in a long time, we are over 91%. And that is something to be celebrated. That is not by accident. That is a lot, a lot of hard work. I talk to high school principals, and they're not doing anything in their power to get kids across the stage. I talk to counselors, I talk to administrators, I talk to teachers, they're like, I'm having that kid come in, we are gonna get them through this class if it kills me. You do whatever you can do because you understand what a disadvantage the students are at if you can't get them across that stage. That rate, again, should be celebrated. We're not probably having as much conversation as we should about it, but we are trying to really toot our horn on. That is some really great work. However, if you look up on some of the items, there are some areas that we know of our concern. I will tell you, when you look at virtual schools and virtual charter schools, I would argue those are some of our most at risk students. Those are either medically fragile, they have needs that aren't great for a traditional setting, we have students who are Olympic athletes and they are just not around. We have kids that's like, this is their last stop until on the street. We have students who are a little bit older that come back and say, I'm gonna give it a try. I'm a little bit older, a little bit wiser, I'm gonna give this a try. Knowing those are gonna be a little bit down, understandably so. However, if you look at virtual charter and traditional public virtual charter schools, that data kind of sent red flags up to state board and to our legislators. And I understand that we probably need to look at it and have some eyes on it. I'm not saying shut it down, but have eyes on it. The problem became is it lumped, it lumped the charter schools in with virtual education. So if you think about where we are with virtual education, your credit recovery, your credit acceleration, your students who have IEPs or 504s who for whatever reason need a hybrid of a learning modality, there are a lot of different reasons why students may be participating in virtual education. Now carving out the remedial part of it, but leaving the rest of it in, if you hit a certain threshold now, which many of our districts are gonna hit, maybe, but many of our districts in theory will hit, if you hit a certain threshold, those students who have so much percent of their day in virtual education are going to get 80% of the funding. Now, the reporting of that, I can see people looking at me now like, are you crazy lady? Those are the people who have done the reporting. The reporting of that will be crazy, almost, uh, almost impossible to follow because that is fluid. You can have a child hit that threshold for the first six weeks and pop right back out of it and go back in it because of their circumstance. That happens a lot, especially with mobility. 
However, that's where we are with some of our bills. Who knows how that will end up in the end? But we have had a lot of conversation trying to talk through, you have got to leave virtual schools separate from virtual education. Because all of you who are in the tech world, you know we have some tech folks in here, you know that makes us go backwards. That does not help us go forward. And Indiana is one of the na national leaders in technology. Whether you love technology or not, tech integration with instruction, we got out ahead of it. We've done really good work in that area. Are we perfect? No. But we really have done some really solid work. If you start saying you can do it, but won't take your money, watch what happens. You have one person in the middle of that mess. You have a student. That's the only person in the middle of that mess. So here are some items that we are watching, but just pay attention to some of the conversations about virtual because it's getting quite interesting from both the House and the Senate. I've had a lot of people call about this and say, are all schools getting $500 extra a kid? No. So what happened was, it was a charter innovation grant that came out really of the House. The Senate removed it. I have no idea where it's at because uh, today it may be completely gone or it could be back. Who knows? But right now, it would be $500 extra per child. It was a $77 million expense. Our charge was, if we have $77 million, you put it in basic tuition support for everyone. That was our charge. Now, I'm not sure we're going to get that done, but again, I'm not, I, I don't know where that landed right now. Mishler, Senator Mishler took that out, and we'll see what happens. But a lot of people are confused by that just because it's a, a per child increase, but that is not traditional public school. So just something to, to pay attention to. Enrollment changes. We're watching this information because of the way the formula works. The more kids you have, the more money you have. That is not a big secret in Indiana. However, bottom line with education enrollment, you can see where we're at. 157 out of 289 districts are declining in enrollment. That's a problem. Then we look at our counties. 37 out of the 92 are declining in population. There is a correlation there. We're watching it closely. So we keep an eye on that because I can about tell you who's going to be in trouble in two, five, ten years. We can look at that trend data and it's not a big secret. I can also tell you the big hacks, the people who they're going to be okay for a while. They're, they're going to be doing okay. It's just the way the formula is set up. I know it's being looked at, it's being reviewed, but this is something that we are really keeping our eyes on right now. This is where we are with population. And I will tell you, having been across the state, you are so fortunate to have green. You are so fortunate to have green. That means you are increasing. You are growing. So for everything to be on county population, and again, that was 16, 17 data, but to be increasing, there are people who would love to be this. I was in South Bend last night, it's not this. I would, you know, we've been in a lot of places that doesn't look like this. So try to go to Delaware County, Madison County, it does not look like this. So, Kudos to all of you, but keep in mind as you are reviewing policy, and I know in the moment you are reviewing it from your lens. From our lens as a department, we have to look at it holistically. This is not the norm that we see, but it really does help in many ways for some of our schools in this area, so that's a good thing. Now you can also see school enrollment though, so there's a lot of different movement going on with student enrollment that we are also paying attention to. But again, I know sometimes no one wants to see any red or any decline, but boy, when I do a comparison of slide to slide, this is one that you should be appreciative of. It really does make a difference. The voucher impact. So as we go across the state and talk to folks about the voucher program, there's a lot of misunderstanding. So whether you like the program or not, that is completely your business. Here's what I want you to see. The fiscal impact that is happening, and I know the superintendents and the CFOs in this room are crystal clear and well aware, but this is the, the impact. When I am out and about, people will ask me, there's still confusion on, well, those kids never attended, or they were in schools, they were at schools, and it got them out. And I'm like, that was the initial intent. That was the initial story. But when you start pulling data, whether you like the data or not, we're just pulling data, we do a report every year, it is a white suburban program. That's what it is at this point. So if you want the data, you want to call it something else, go ahead. But if you look at the data, that's what it is. So 58% of the students who are utilizing it have never been in a public school. So when I go out, we're like, that's a great way to get kids out of failing schools. They've not been in a school. That's not what it is at this point. You also have 58% using it that are white. 
followed by 21% that are Hispanic. You have 59% who are using it that have an income of over $50,000. So when I hear people say, well, it really helps students of poverty, I'm not sure your definition of poverty, but when there's 59% using $50,000 or making $50,000 or more that are using the program, I think it's just good for us to be aware of that information. We have an increase in the voucher program. I know today we had a lot of people stop by our office that were upset and said, do something. Okay, I mean, that's outside of my authority, but we can, we can share the information. $18,000 for the voucher expansion, but you have to remember the other monies that are coming off the top. So again, some of you may think that is a great program, we like it, and others are like, it's very problematic. Regardless of where you stand, it's just good to be informed. It's good to be informed. So as you're looking at programs, you can talk intelligently about truly what's happening with that impact. Referendums, crystal clear. Every day I'm told this, probably multiple times a day right now as we're meeting with General Assembly members. If they don't have the money, they have a mechanism. Tell them to run a referendum. And some of you in here have done it. Some of you are gearing up to do it. Some of you are gonna do them again. I mean, we're all over the place, but when you get upset with your local schools because you're like, you're running a referendum again, your beef is not with your superintendent. They have to generate dollars to operate. So the referendum game is real. It is real. Interestingly, when you look at, there are two, going to be three now, as far as uh, referendum options, if it, things go through. The general fund referendum is interesting. Out of the 66 that have been attempted, so out of the 66 that have attempted with declining enrollment, or I'm sorry, 26 of the 66 had declining enrollment. So when you talk about the schools most at risk and who needs the funding and who probably needs to be looking at a referendum, those are your schools who some of the time aren't even attempting it. When we talk to them, it's a lot of, we know our communities, that's never gonna go. We've got too much farmland, we've got too many retirees, we just know our folks, that's not going to work. So is it an option for everybody? I mean, that's the conversation we're having. Are we creating the haves and have nots? You try to run this in Randolph County. You try to run one in Cass County. You try to run one up in Erie. I mean, it really does send another picture and another message. The construction, we're having uh, some luck as, with, as well. I will tell you, overall, these percentages are impressive because I, I know we talked about this earlier. Referendums are a ton, a ton of work for everybody. They're for the community, for the students, for families, for administrators, it's a lot of work. Indiana has been pretty successful with that. But again, I'm worried about those that are like, there's no way I'm trying that because there's no way I can pass it. The other piece that's gonna be interesting is if the safety referendum language stays true. That's gonna be interesting because I think it's a different dynamic when you come to your community and say, I need to build versus I want to keep your kids safer. So that's going to be interesting on where that lands. I know really, I mean, we've had some other districts that have used some of that general fund referendum for safety purposes, but when you can say we are doing it for the purpose of safety, period, that's, that can be a different conversation. It'll be interesting to see what happens with that. The governance structure, we share this because it is unique, and people will argue, is it, is it not unique? You make up your own mind, but I will tell you across the nation, I've had some calls going, you people have lost your mind. I'm like, it's not my mind. So this is the governance structure. Currently, Indiana is designed that our state board is very heavy with government and governor appointees. Now, whether you agree or disagree with that, that's what it is. It's, it's the governor's board, period. Then you move over to the Department of Education, which is my office the Commission of Higher Ed, DWD, which are under the governor. So the governor's the three out of the four quadrants, which I understand, I, I get it. I get the position, I understand the, the authority and the power, and I, I understand it. What's interesting is post-2020, when my position becomes a appointed position, this structure is what's not normal. So we will have the state board, still by the governor, you will have the department, the commission, and the department of education all controlled by one office. That is not the norm. We have found one other state that plays in that arena, and it's not good. So this is just interesting to watch the dynamics. We have said, if you want my position, the state superintendent position to be appointed, okay, I, I get it. I, I get it. We can have the debate on whether we agree with it. 
So there's no people voice there. So where's the people's voice? We've said confirm that person. So like at the federal level where it goes through the Senate to get confirmation, we've said at least let the power be in the people's voice in those confirmations. Or you look at the state board, which many, many states have state boards that are elected. So they're regionally elected so that you have some other mechanism for your local voice in this dynamic. If not, you have a tremendous amount of power in one office. It's just what you, you may be like, yeah, that's awesome. And others may be like, huh. So depending on where you stand on that, it's just good for you to have that information so you can think about it. Because it's just an interesting governance structure. In 2020, I told the people, and I'm sure it's going to hit the press again because we talked about it yesterday and today, we keep telling people. In 2020, shame on us as K-12 educators if we don't start pushing on officials who are running for offices at the local level, at the state level, and at the national level. That K-12 conversation needs to be alive and in the forefront. We need to start asking some questions. But not, when I was on the campaign trail, which I knew my role, I would take those education questions. And I watched everybody else kind of skirt around them. And I thought, man. But at the time, I knew that was my charge. And I took that. I mean, I knew what I was running for. It'll be interesting when there's no me running, when there's no Glenda running, when there's no one running for that office but the governor. Are we going to, the, whoever the people may be, are we going to push on those issues or are we going to give them a pass? Shame on us if we give them a pass. What is the philosophy of education? Where is your plan? Who are you running as state superintendent? Who are you going to point? We need to know your philosophy. We need to know where you stand. If we don't ask, I promise you no one's going to tell. So we need to start making some really concerted efforts to start being educated and start asking questions. It doesn't matter if it's a Republican, Democrat, Independent. That's not where I'm going with it. I don't care who's running for governor. On any side, we need to start asking some questions. Because of this, there's so much power in that office. It, it, this is just an area that we need to pay attention to. This is where we are in strategic plans as a state. We're watching literacy, STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, and CTT. This is not a secret to districts. A lot of districts are on the same path. Interestingly, the bottom two pretty much align to the state as a whole. Where we get a little off and I get a lot of questions would be the literacy. But all of you in this room know if you don't get a good, solid, foundational start in literacy, it doesn't matter what happens on the other two. Because it's pretty darn hard if a kid comes to high school, ask your high school principals, and they're like, yeah, the kid's reading at fourth grade level, I gotta get him through science. Good luck. Good luck. So we are still maintaining that emphasis on literacy in that K-2 space and trying to add some really good frameworks and really good tools. I know our early literacy people are trying to get out in front of it. It is a tough lift. And I know many of our districts have focused through multi-tier systems of support and some of your programming and your staffing. And you, I have faith in our districts to get this area done. But I will tell you, this is one area that I, I, we get a lot of push, push back on what we're doing. Well, you can't take your eyes off that. You cannot. Now, the next person probably will, but we will not. So STEM and then that College and Career Tech Guide. These are just some tools that we have provided for your districts. And the reason I show you this is because we have a really, really good team at the department. And I'm super proud of them. They've gotten a lot done. Our philosophy at the department is more of guidance and support. It is not top-down control and command. We live through that. It does not work. So our philosophy is we need to have followers, and our followers have to be great leaders. And I will tell you, I have been really, really, really impressed by the leadership across our state. Do we have some work to do? Absolutely. But we have got some really great leaders across our state that are doing some really, really great work. And that's leadership at the central office level, building level, and the classroom level. Just really solid work. So something to be proud of. The SEL, I'm going to take a moment for non-educators or people who are like, what is that? That's that social emotional learning, which we all know is extremely important beyond just the academic piece. We are struggling to get that pushed through with school safety. It's the oddest thing I've ever been part of. So we thought we had it through the House, then we had some pushback in the Senate. We're going back and forth as far as, is it too soft? And I'm like, really? I mean, educators know how much emphasis right now and how important the social emotional learning piece is. If we could figure that piece out, the academic piece would be so much easier. 
But that is a piece that we're all struggling. I don't care if you're coming from a district of poverty or a district of wealth. We are all struggling with the SEL. It is expensive. So the partnerships we're trying to develop, the staffing we're trying to boost, that is an expensive adventure. Ask your superintendents, they will tell you, it is not cheap, it is necessary. But that SEL piece, we are still having conversations on. It, it, I don't even know how to react when I'm told it's just soft. It's too hard to define. Well, you tell that to a, a state that has second in the nation on suicide attempts for high school students. Like, are we gonna have the conversation or are we gonna say it's too soft? So those are the areas that we are still hammering in to, to really see some movement in. We have got to address this. We have too many volatile parts. Again, a lot going on in STEM. One piece up here I want to bring your attention to is the cyber course. Interestingly, when we open that up, I was like, if we get 10, I'm super excited to start a cyber course for high school. We also started a cyber campaign for the district level to help employees. So I was like, we get this going, that's awesome. We are now at 60 high schools, and that is a very, very short amount of time. Now, it sends me over the edge when the high schools call and go, hey, that's great, but your training is closed. I'm like, what? So we, we're trying to figure some of that out, but I will tell you that cyber piece is moving, and that's a, a thank you to the districts who are saying, we'll, we'll get on board with that and add opportunity for students, but things like that truly, truly make a difference. Now, our STEM ask, based on our STEM council, based on the governor's request, came up with a STEM plan. We had a lot of people at the table. We had Lily, we had ag people, we had educators, we had legislators. We had a lot of people at the table for the STEM plan. It's solid, it is solid. But we need $20 million to even just start pushing the envelope. So we put our $20 million ask. Right now it's sitting at a million dollars. Now if you want to push STEM in the state of Indiana, less than a dollar per child is not going to get it done. So at a time where we're saying fill those jobs, you got a million to fill over the next 10 years, and oh, by the way, many of them are high wage, high demand STEM jobs, but we're gonna give you a dollar, less than a dollar per student per year, in addition to what you get out of your funding. It becomes an issue of priorities. And I know $20 million wouldn't even scratch the surface. I get it, we have labs that don't have equipment. We have labs that aren't modernized. We have curriculum that needs serious work. I mean, I'm across the state, I look at those things because you have those who are like, man, this, is, this could go up against any college. The facilities are just amazing and lab equipment, the modernization of it. And I walk into some schools and there's a bag of dirt and a beaker. And I'm like, what is going on? Because they're like, we don't have the funding for the equipment or the clientele it doesn't necessarily take care of some of the equipment. And so they've got this nonstop battle with trying to fund it. So the STEM piece is something that we're paying attention to, that all of you know the importance of that. We have got to fund it. I can find the money today. I can find it. It's just, you gotta prioritize. So that funding piece is interesting. We do have our framework out that I know many of our districts are looking at, but we will continue with the STEM plan. We're just gonna struggle with the funding. CTE, as a state, we're doing really, really well. Something to pay attention to, 88% of our high school graduates already take at least one career tech ed course. Now for some of you, you're like, what is that? That career tech ed, we talk about, used to be like vocational education. Some of you, you at a shop, depending on when you went through school. But that career tech ed piece is very much more modernized. We have districts that are working really hard in this arena. But I know it got a lot of noise this session. Something to pay attention to, hooked to all this, if our educators are getting license renewal with PGP points. So you can either go traditional to a college or you can get professional growth points and get 90 and renew your license. So most of the educators are like, yeah, I get that. Now to renew license at the language stage, you have to have 15 hours in industry. So whether you're a kindergarten teacher, special ed teacher, shop teacher, you know, CTE, welding, whatever the case may be, you'd have to have those 15 hours. So we've already had people call and go, how are we going to scale that? Like, what does that look like? I don't know. I mean, we'll see if the language goes through and it sticks. You will have to have help. We are, we are gearing up to help. We're gonna have to have some districts help us. I met with uh, South Bend Chamber and brought it up and they looked at me like I had 10 heads and I'm like, we'll help you figure it out. So when you think about 75,000 teachers who may go that route, where is the capacity for that? So I, I know we also had teachers going, is that really appropriate for the kindergarten teacher? And we can have that debate, 
regarding, I think it's good for us to know what's going on in the workplace. We have programs that allow that now, but that PGP piece is gonna be interesting. Some districts won't have a problem at all. There will be other districts where we're really gonna to have to assist. So we're trying to gear up to figure out if that's gonna go through. Externships. We have put a lot of our money, our state money, toward allowing educators to go into that business arena and work for two weeks, be exposed for three weeks, one week, whatever the case may be, toward their interest. So if they're like, I'm a physics teacher and I wanna see how Lily works, we're gonna say, okay, here's your money to go into Lily for one week, two week, three week, whatever it may be, if they agree to take you as an extern. So we are doing a lot of that partnering, so I'm not anti any of that. My concern is scaling it and making sure it's of quality and also listening to the educators on interest. I think that's gonna be an interesting dynamic. A lot of things happening, obviously, at the State House. We talked about most of these. Something of importance that's kind of coming in and kind of coming out. So high school principals, heads up. In that virtual bill, we saw that resurgence of Code 20, which is when the kids are in your school and they say, I'm going to leave you and go get homeschooled. There are some caveats now of when you can and cannot count them. So that kind of got in at the last hour. I don't know if it's in there now. Honestly, it could be out. It's a moving target, but just something to pay attention to. School safety, letting you know $60 million a year in Indiana for assessment. $60 million is what we spend on assessment. School safety, we're begging for 14. So will you have school safety referendums? Probably, probably. That's gonna be a mechanism. All of us are trying to regroup and, and some of our districts have done a really great job others are just trying to figure out the funding piece of it so the school safety piece is still out there it just keeping it in perspective when we bring up those numbers so that people who are not educators understand the wonkiness of that priority on the millions of dollars it's just I think something important to know any questions after all that good news right Thanks for coming tonight, Dr. McCormick. I don't really have a question. I just want to give you a, a couple of comments. Um, one, to confirm what you had said earlier about House Bill 1404, uh, we ended up today was what they call third reading deadline, which basically means if it doesn't pass today, it's dead. And uh, Senator Rotz was the, the Senate sponsor and did not call it. So that bill has uh, ceased to exist as of this Senate session. Uh, one other thing I was just gonna say, just to affirm what Dr. McCormick is saying. Uh, she will be, for the first time in, in Indiana history, the last uh, publicly elected superintendent of public construction. And uh, I have been one of those that's been consistently against that for exactly the reasons you described. And that is that this was at least one way in which the people of our state could have a voice in this process uh, my very first year, very first session, everything's new, and uh, this one came down the pike and sent me to the principal's office a few times where I had conversations with the governor about it. And um, so I remember sitting in his office and he was feeling me out on this thing and I said, well, here's, here's my feeling. Uh, should more power be in the hands of more people or less people? Which is exactly the point you're making here. I said, based on our system of government and our constitution, uh, the hand, power should be in the hands of more people, and this is a mechanism by which the people can speak. He said, well, if that's the case, then in theory, every uh, position in the administration should be elected. I said, yeah, you could make that point, but they aren't. This one still is, and uh, he then also said, uh, that also assumes that people should be informed in who they elect. I said, exactly right, and that's their responsibility to be informed. My responsibility is to protect their ability to have that voice at the uh, ballot. 
Well, as you know, that has uh, passed and then based on Dr. McCormick's announcement of not running, they've moved that date up. And so I just want to affirm what you're saying and that call to all of you to make sure you stay on top of these things because uh, it will be up to you to make sure that you're vetting whoever the, the potential candidates are for whoever's going to be the next uh, superintendent of public instruction. But just wanted to give you a couple updates there and thank you very much for being here. Appreciate it. mentioned the social and emotional learning and the money that you're spending on that. Could you define what you mean by social and emotional learning? And also, here in Avon, we've had a fairly successful program called Leader in Me at two elementary schools. I'm aware of my son actually attends that group, and it's an amazing program. And I'm just wondering if you had any comments about that, specifically about that program in the state. Yeah, I will say we got a large federal grant that allowed us to select three districts, Avon being one of them. Um, we try to go large, mid-sized, small, to really have districts try different models that would be useful to scale, collect data on, to say, is it a good ROI, and how are we measuring that? We are in a territory that even how to measure it is being questioned. And so we're looking at our districts who are piloting many, many different programs. We try to make sure that those were some vetted programs so that we are servicing our kids using multiple mechanisms. Through our multi-tiered multi systems of support, different districts are using different things for the behavioral piece. And I know there's debate whether the social emotional learning and the, the mental health piece, which is more diagnostic, that's been an interesting conversation. But many of our districts, and do, am I going to sit here and give you an exact definition? No. Um, but I will tell you there are a lot of students through the social-emotional learning piece through, uh, that need a lot of assistance. So we're trying to develop some of those to learn from each other. I don't have all the answers. We're work, working with a lot of the university folks, um, our healthcare professions, FSSA, other agencies to help us with this. What I will say, though, is we have a lot of schools that tell us we need more school counselors, we need more social workers, we need more behavioral type of contracts to help us with some of the social emotional pieces. So the other piece of it is we're looking at some of the coursework that universities are doing in that arena to be more purposeful about it in the middle school, high school arena. So we are doing some of that work again. It is not perfect, but there's enough people who are sending signals from us from the local level to say, we need assistance in this arena. is while I realize the state funding for education is a large piece of that pie. And I know it's I know it's intricate and I know that there's some things you gotta watch here and watch there like we discussed earlier in respect to funding for the, uh, the buildings themselves or the teachers. Um, in your opinion, is the amount of funding that the state gives to education sufficient? Or is it possibly and, and, and maybe it's just not being managed correctly or do we need more allocated, and you know, outside of referendums? So it's a great question. So a couple of things. One, we are expensive. We're over half of the state budget, so we do get a lot of attention because we're super expensive. I get that. I also hear conversations from folks saying, I live in X district, and they're not fiscally efficient, or they're not fiscally responsible, or they're not transparent. So I've heard all that, too. I've also seen districts that are doing a magnificent job with balancing that, being very fiscally prudent, making sure that you are partnering, that a lot of great work's going on in that, in that arena. So I've seen it kind of all over the place. Here's what I will tell you. When you start comparing at the national level, when we are dead last, 50th out of 50, on the amount of teacher increase in pay from 2002 to now, we're dead last. 
You have to have the conversation, is it enough? I would argue it's not enough. I know it is extremely expensive to educate a child. And I know that one number doesn't equate to every single child because there are a lot of different needs. But that, that amount of money has become problematic with inflation, and with some of our programs going through, with the way our formula works. There are a lot of layers to it. But can we get better at the fiscal piece? We always have room for improvement. We always have room for improvement. But I will say the majority of our districts are doing a really good job with the resources they have, but they, it's at that point where we have got to invest more in that K-12 arena. We have to. I would also argue you got to tack in the pre-K area that we're woefully underspending in. That pre-K piece, many of our districts are doing a great job, but we still have counties that are void of quality programs. That is going to catch up with us. It's already caught up with us. So it's never enough. There's no, if people say, what is that dollar amount? It really, one, depends on district, but it also, it's just when you start looking nationally and making those comparisons, we are, we're not where we need to be. Dr. Butts, Superintendent of the Year. Yeah, You're welcome. <laughs> Jeff Bunson, Superintendent of Common School District, Wayne Township. I'm also a resident of Wayne Township. A couple of topics that you hit on that I'd like to, uh, to talk a little bit about. Uh, obviously, we are over half of the state's budget, uh, but we need not to forget that in 2007, we as voters made a conscientious decision in two consecutive years to put in place circuit breaker. And at that same time, our General Assembly promised to continue to fund our schools in, a, in an appropriate amount. And since 2007, our legislators have not done that. General Assembly has not kept up with inflation, and our property taxes have been capped. And so uh, the assumption that 50% is high is true. However, it is a result of the state saying, we're going to take this burden off of local taxpayers and then put it back on them as a referendum, which we are at today with being a referendum state. That being said, there have been many opportunities and many discussions this session on how to fix the teacher pay issue. All of them have fallen flat because it is a terribly complex issue. It is one that is bargained locally with the exclusive representation of the Teachers Association and the elected school board in each community. Short of going to a state salary schedule, which I don't think any, uh, any district in the state would like to, to go to, how do we solve this? What is, what is that answer for, uh, obviously, more money, but how do we ensure that none of us today would argue that our teachers are paid enough, uh, that the, none of our employees in public education are paid enough. How do we continue to try to operate uh, under the current circumstances we're in, not giving up with inflation, and make sure that we're pushing as many dollars as we can to teachers' salaries? So it's a complex question, and I appreciate the question. It, it can be quite frustrating. A reminder, the governor came out and said he's going to develop a committee, and he's going to study this. The concern came because there was really no educator on the committee except for on the committee that was for informing purposes only. So there was a superintendent, I believe, and maybe a teacher, I have to look at that, a CFO, sorry. Um, but there's a committee being formed to help study that. We've also said, now that I am looking at the lens of the state level, we have provided some suggestions for cost savings. So a lot of us do a lot of good cost sharing right now. A lot of us are really good at purchasing right now at the local level, but I would argue there's some more cost savings to that. There are also programs, some ships that are being built at the state level that there is no intention to sail that ship. I have no patience for that. So where I'm like, we don't need that. We already have it. That's $5 million. We may not have the Cadillac, but we have a Volkswagen and it's running. Why are, why are we not looking at all those pieces and putting it toward that funding? So there are some ways to get dollars back into the classroom. There are some other ways to look at some things differently. As far as there are some ideas being floated that just because we weren't asked to be part of that committee, the department was carved out of that, we're not gonna be quiet, we will develop our own committee, and there are some folks in here that are on that, to generate some ideas to say, what are we gonna to take to that committee? We just can't sit back and be quiet. We have to look at the big picture, but it goes from anything from purchasing, tax generation, um, there are just a lot of pieces to it. So 
There's no easy answer to that. You also are sitting on a huge surplus. And I know people who are conservative fiscally are like, leave it alone, leave it alone. There are other people like, spend that sucker down. So you've got both sides of that coming at the state level, but that's another piece of this. Indiana is very heavy on some of their tax forgiveness. TIF districts are getting very interesting for some of our districts. So there are a lot of pieces to it that we are looking at. There's no one answer to this but it's going to take money to operate. You cannot operate expensive schools without putting toward the money it has to have to operate. There, we just have to look at it through a lot of lenses. There's no one answer, but I will tell you there are a lot of people trying to look at it. For this biennium, we're out of time. I mean, that's the reality of it. Here's what's frustrating. There were a lot of promises made. A lot of promises made out of the gate. For instance, the 8515, I listened to state leadership say if we do this your teachers are going to get a five percent increase you know what that was that was a big false promise no way there is no way that's going to equate to a five percent raise and if you're in a district where you get one you should celebrate and stay put for a while that is not the norm but to come out i go across the state and, just, and teachers are now telling me but i read the article and there's a five percent increase coming that is a false promise, and what that's going to create is promise at the bargaining table. So when you have a superintendent and a CFO going, not really, and they're like, but I read the article, I saw the news clip, I'm watching social media, and they said it would equate to a 5% raise. Then you have local infighting versus your energy should be spent at the state level. But those are the kind of things going through. Now, we did appreciate the turf option, buying down that turf, getting that percentage down for our districts. That is a good solution. And we went to the governor's office and said, good solution. I mean, that was a, a good thing. There were other parts of it that we're not super happy with, but those are the type of conversations you have to have. What I don't agree with is carving people out of that conversation. That is not healthy for a state. You've got a lot of smart people who have been in school finance for a long time that have some really, really good ideas, but their hands have been tied. But you start asking them, they're like, you could look at this with ag land, you could look at this, you could look at that, you could, I mean, they just start rattling off things that make real good common, common sense. But you have to have the conversation. So we are looking at that super complex issue. There's no easy solution, but for this biennium, that ship has sailed. I mean, that we are out of time with that budget. Good evening, Dr. McCormick. Thanks for being here, and thank you for being a rebel rouser. I appreciate <laughs> I appreciate you standing up for our teachers and for our kids. When you said, I believe you said $60 million we are spending on assessments, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about how we get um, a handle on these assessments and we do what's right for the kids? So some of that is a necessity out of the federal requirement, not all of it. Now, interestingly, there are people who are hearing from the feds, get creative, do this, do that. Good luck getting it through. So it looks good in an article. It looks good for the one district who or the state who tries it and they're back to square one. So careful what you read and read that with a lens that's more accurate. So that testing piece, a lot of that comes from the federal government, the requirement. Now we can say as a state, we don't want to do that any longer. Out of our $9 billion budget, one billion is federal money. So if we're willing to forgive one million dollars, we can say OSPA to the testing, which is interesting. We've also approached some of our state leaders and say, we have a solution. Here's how we can save money. So we're throwing all kinds of solutions out. For instance, I read. It would not take a huge lift to turn with a few questions in I Learn 3 to do the exact same thing and give you some good data. That would be a big cost savings, time savings, prep savings, the list goes on for third grade. But you have to have an appetite to change that. So until that happens, we will continue to spend an enormous amount of money on testing. I would also argue, although there are parts of Grad Pathway that I think people can get behind, we are already getting calls going, who's funding that? Tag not it. I don't have the money to fund it, so I have districts that are saying some of these credential tests are extremely expensive and we've not given it because of XYZ or when we do have the money we put toward it, but who's going to ensure access to different pathways that students can now take to graduate? And some of them are assessments, some are free, some are just pricey. And so who's gonna pick that bill up? 
So when we went with our numbers and said, hey, that $60 million isn't going to get us there, because some of our districts do not have the families that they can say, we'll take the SAT, we'll take the ACT, we'll take it a couple times, and if that doesn't work, I'm gonna pay for the welding certification. Good for you if that's your district, but that is not the norm. So we are trying to figure out what that looks like, what do we need to do, but my fear is that expense of testing is continuing to climb. We're, like I said, we're already getting calls. We're saying, how, how is this going to work? And it's not that they're saying we don't want to do it. It's how is it going to actually work? And so the fiscal piece that we were saying from the beginning, pump the brakes, give us a minute to figure out the fiscal piece because we knew the biennium was coming up. No, not gonna pump the brakes. Here we are today, we had about 1% of our schools use it. So I think that, that I don't think it will pick up, especially with some I-STEP I 10 issues, that will pick up. But I do not foresee the cost of assessment going down anytime soon. I also don't see the time going down. That was our goal with iLearn, get that time down, get that time down. That with grad pathways for our high school kids, I'm assuming that's gonna go up. I'm already hearing a lot of stories about a lot of testing. So we'll see where that takes us. Hi, Dr. McCormick. Thank you so much for coming to talk with us. Um, I would like to talk more about teacher compensation, but unfortunately it raises my blood pressure to the point of being unsafe, so I don't want to talk about that. Um, I want to make um, an appeal to you, something that was not on my radar until just recently. Um, I happened to go to the National School Board Association uh, meeting, the convention in Philadelphia, where there was a lot of talk in some of the very dense population states about the effect of the 2020 census accuracy on educational funding. Um, unfortunately, there are a lot of um, illegal aliens, as we can see and reflected in the ELL, but also um, homeless population that will have profound impact if not counted in the funding for school corporations that um, enjoy a, a great deal of those types of populations. Um, Indiana School Board Association is really working hard in the next 12 months, because the census will hit us in 12 months, um, to assist with getting um, more accuracy and reflected so that every student counts and that funding can follow those students. I would just appeal to you and the um, IDOE to help partner with us along with other collaborative partnerships um, in order to um, make sure that we do everything possible for educational funding to make the census accurate. Is, are there any things that your office is presently doing to ensure that? Yes, and I appreciate that question. Our team, depending on the area they serve, We've been out in D.C. quite a bit, having conversations about just this. Will it hit Indiana? You bet. So the degree is the, de is the question. So yes, given some of our counts are very dependent upon that data, and if that data is skewed in a negative manner, we're going to feel it. We're going to feel it. Again, it's $1 billion. So we are watching that issue. We've been having conversations. It's interesting, and I'm just going to be honest, regardless of your political affiliation, you have to have a willingness to have that conversation on the impact it's going to have and that risk versus reward of what's happening. And there are some folks at the federal level that want those numbers suppressed. And that does not help us. And so we are having those conversations. It's just odd because of the situation that that's in, but, but we are aware of that. I know a lot of people, we have some time, not a ton of time, um, but it will impact our schools. So we have teams that go out in different areas, trying to just bring back information, talking about the situation, trying to educate ourselves and others. And so it's been quite interesting, but we're worried. Yeah. She is not a plant. That is Holly Stockler, our communication director. So she reads all of our communication that goes out. I appreciate that, Holly. Yes. Hi, I have a SEL question. Are you aware of any data from states that incorporate SEL in general education about possible declines in other alternative, separate alternative education uh, programs and if there's any monetary benefits for that? 
So we're one of two states that has an SEL person who is specifically obligated to that work. We are watching a lot of the other states, so hopefully not to reinvent the wheel, but we are watching a lot of the programs, we're watching a lot of the results, we're watching some of the assessments that are connected to that area, so we're trying to get a good handle on what's out there, what has worked, what is that doing across the board to some of the data, including attendance and discipline, and it goes on. So our team is working on that. Again, we are in really early stages, and we rely a lot on outside partners. So we're doing a lot of partnering in that area to try to move that work. It's not perfect. I'm not going to stand up here and say it's perfect. Um, but we're hearing loud and clear from our schools that they need a lot of assistance. We've had people call about curriculums. We've had people call about assessment pieces, the privacy tied to that. We're having just a lot of interesting conversations in that whole space. The school safety conversation regarding shared data that's getting a lot of noise in Indiana because Indiana, we really love our privacy. And I'm not saying I don't love my need too. However, when you're trying to share some of that data that's playing into some of that decision making that's cross agency, that's linked to one individual, that, that can get a little dicey. So we're trying to work, it just can't be the department coming up with some of these solutions. We're trying to work with a multitude of state level, healthcare, and the list goes on. So it's complex. Again, we're not exactly where we need to be, but we are looking at everything that we can potentially look at. If you have anybody in this room has information to share or some expertise in that area, we are always willing to, to listen and, and take feedback. You had mentioned about the $60 million for assessment, but what was more astonishing on your presentation was the $14 million that only went to school safety. Mm -hmm. So can you maybe explain on that a little bit? more about the rationale behind that and what as um, parents can we do to maybe push that envelope a little bit more to stress the importance for the safety of our students in our schools? So it's a great question. How do you push that conversation? One, make sure people are educated in your district on that number. People who push back on that say, well, yeah, but districts still spend a lot more out of their operation or education fund. Yes, they do, but they're also spending more money on assessment as well. So that argument doesn't wipe out the other. So I understand that piece of it, but districts are still spending money out of their operation and education fund for both of those items. So it's extremely expensive. Districts have done a really good job of trying to balance that school safety piece. It is expensive. So there are some districts that have total police departments, some have one SRO, others have multiple SROs, some don't have any, some are heavy in school counselors, others are like one school counselor, five social workers, I mean it's all over the place. School safety is expensive and it depends a lot on the need and the community and there's just a lot of pieces to it. So making sure people are aware of some of those numbers. I just don't want you to feel like that's the only money going to school safety because like I said, schools are putting a great deal of their, their funds, their current accessible funds towards school safety and will continue to do that. With that $14 million, interestingly, that stayed from the special session and now, given where we are, more people will be eligible for that money. So more entities, so private schools, more charter schools will be eligible. So before, when we, let's say, we're, I'm just going to throw out a number, we had 100 schools that were eligible and receive that grant. You now still probably have 100 schools that are eligible, and I'm just throwing that number out, to receive that grant. But your potential applicants has sold. So you have more people needing the money and less money. So that's gonna bring an interesting dynamic too, where some of our districts, and some are in here, say we rely on that money for half of our SRO, or our drug dogs, or whatever the case may be, our apps, our bus cameras, you name it. Now you're like, now what? Now what are we gonna do? Because you've been relying upon that money. I know, I've heard from a lot of people, those grants are moving slow. The grants that, that come, that's another issue. So if you apply for a grant and you're expecting the grant and it's super slow moving, we're trying to be a good partner of that. That's not our office. I will take the hits for a lot of things, not that one. Um, but we're trying to be a good partner on trying to help get those out because I know some schools are quite frustrated with the pace of that money that's going out. We're trying really hard to, to help with that. Any other questions? It's a long walk. It is. It's like Chris is right. I want you to like run and get five. 
Um, I know that uh, from downtown in a, in, a, in a place where they're not close to the public schools and things like that, it'd be really easy not to be fully aware of the challenges facing teachers, challenges facing the students, and all of this. Do you know what it is that uh, our legislators are doing to stay closely in touch with the needs of our teachers in the K-12 schools? It's a great question. We have some legislators that attend events and listen and make comments and question. We have some that are not gonna go to their school and everything in between. So you need to, I would still challenge our legislators, invite them into your schools. I always had our lawmakers into our school, invite them in, educate them, get them in front of teachers, but it shouldn't be a situation that's hostile. I've seen that go bad. That's not the best way to handle that. If you bring a legislator in, you need to make sure that is a professional conversation. So there are different ways to handle that, but it's all over the place. We've had some that you know will attend those teacher meetings, that go to staff meetings, that tour schools that are very involved, that go to events, and others you just really have to push. And if you can't get them to come in, if they're not involved, if they're not interested, that's where it becomes a, you don't stop the emails, you don't stop the phone calls, you don't stop the testimonies on the floor, you still have to be a voice. You know, we get, we are who we are and we get what we get by who we vote into office and i'm a firm believer you vote people in including myself and you hold us accountable i am your voice i am an extension of the public education folks in indiana so you need to make sure you're holding people accountable you need to do a deep dive into asking questions ask them that goes back to that 2020 you ask them, what, are, what is your philosophy on public education? When was the last time you were in your schools that you represent? When have you talked to your superintendent? When did you talk to your school business official? When did you talk to teachers? When have you talked to community folks? We need to start asking better questions. We let them way off the hook. And then they're in office and we're like, wow, it's not going so well. Really? So that's on us to be better voters, more educated, and also hold people accountable. We have to do that. It's a great question. Well, I'm John Spars, I'm one of the Oriole Advocates, and I wanted to thank you uh, for your time today. And I also wanted to recognize Senator Crane for being here, but also Representative Thompson, Representative Sturwald, who have been very professional and very willing to meet with us as a group, hear our concerns, and respond to them in a very timely way. So I wanted to recognize them for that as well. Um, I'm someone who you know, worked with uh, the local uh, group in trying to get a referendum passed. and. Uh, so glad that it did, and I see a $1.5 million hit that we're taking because of the voucher program. And with the information you shared today, as well as some that I learned prior, really changed my view about uh, the, the purpose of the voucher program and school choice, because I was under the impression, as many are, that it was that way for people to escape failing schools, and it does not seem to be that way. That being said, there seems to be quite a bit of momentum around the voucher program, and I, and I don't believe it's going to be reversed. But I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how a group of parent advocates and others might work to at least slow down that train or get a point where perhaps the impact is capped so it doesn't continually eat away at the public school dollars. So again, we are who we vote for. But you have to educate people. You have to get the information out. Social media is a beautiful thing. Facts are stubborn. So if people are upset because you're sharing the fact that your school system loses that amount of money, that's a result of a policy. That's not that you're making it up. You're not even telling them what to think about it. It's just you are sharing information. People are busy. You have busy lives, things get moving, and you are trusting that the system will work. As school people, we are pretty resilient. So we're like, eh, we're not gonna like that, but we're gonna figure it out and make it work. At some point, we have to stop that at some point we have to start asking questions but our charge is trying to educate our communities and it is tough we have one of the lowest state voting percentages across the nation our youth voting percentage is they only studied 36 states and we were like number 29 so that's not great so there are a lot of pieces to it that in, in addition to educating families and community members, we have to encourage people to voice, voice it through vote. And so there are a lot of pieces to it, which is big pieces to, to, 
to deal with. But I would just encourage you to share that information. And again, I mean, there are a lot of ways to do that, but we have all the data. I will give a shout out to Dr. Downs in Allen County. He's done an extensive amount of work. He knows it inside and out, and he will be happy to come to any community that asks him for information. He's done presentations for our General Assembly. He's given presentations to communities. It's just to educate folks on how those programs actually work. And then you make up your own mind, whether you like it or you don't like it. It's just a matter of staying educated. But we have all that information. It's how do you get it out? How do you share it in a way people can understand it? Dr. McCormick, thank you for coming. We're very, very grateful. The mission of the Oriel Advocates that started five years ago was to learn, communicate, and advocate. And I know you have experience that they do so in a, in a manner that is very civil and very respectful, and we appreciate that. <laughs> Listening to you speak tonight reminds me of just prior to your election when you were gracious enough to come to Hendricks County and meet with the Hendricks County superintendents. And I'll never forget, you did not, you were not lusting after this job. You were not dying to be in this elected position, and yet you ran, you got elected, and you have served remarkably well. And on behalf of all of us, I just want to say we are so glad that you are our state superintendent and that you are advocating for our children and for our teachers and for all Hoosiers and that you're going to continue until 2020. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, I tried to make my straw not be the short straw, but it didn't work out. No, it was really a moment of service. And I would encourage you, some of you folks who are in here, we need good people to run for office. We need good people, and you're like, you're crazy. I can see some of your faces right now. Like, Lady, no. We need good people to do it. We need good people to run for office. Look what's happening across the nation with educators who are running for office, with smart business folks who are running for office, who people who serve in different capacities running for office. We need good people to run. It is super hard and it is not super fun, but we need good people. So if anyone out there has an inkling to do something about that, we are happy to help. Happy to help. Got some of it figured out. I appreciate all of you being here. I know you're busy. Thank you, Avon. Thank you, other districts who took the time to come out. Thank you, community members. If you need something, please contact our department. We do not have all the answers. It is not a pride issue for us. Let us know how we can get better so we can continue to serve kids. Again, thank you for having us. We appreciate being here this evening. They are very approachable. We've had developed a good rapport with them. 
Let them know how you feel and make it personal. Let them know how it affects your family and your, your kids. Um, they, they, they are really good about that. <laughs> they don't make you feel, they don't belittle you, they're not gonna attack you, they're easy. Especially when you call downtown too. They're easy to talk to as well. Um, so again, thank you everyone. Dr. McCormick, you have flowers. Please take them and we just appreciate you being here. So thank you very much. Thank you everyone.